right, shall we, shall we get started? I thought this was going to be an intimate affair, but it's staying remote right now, so that's, that's good. We're happy to have so many people here. There's some chairs kind of in the middle, if anyone wants to find a chair. Um, I'd like to, to welcome everyone here today. Uh, my name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm in the Ward 3 City Council. I'm um, sponsoring this forum with Ward 4 City Council, being the sheriff. And let me also note some other folks who are here uh, today as well. City Council President Bill White is here. Uh, City Council at Large, Jesse Adams is here. Uh, Ward 6 City Council, Mary Ann Labarge. Um, I'm not sure if I missed anyone else. Um, but for the record, I'll also note that there's five councils here, and we've taken the step of uh, posting this meeting as a simultaneous meeting of the City Council ahead of time, just to make sure uh, we're complying with the spirit of the open meetings law. Uh, no votes are going to be taken tonight. This is just a form, but I, I note that for the record. I also note that um, this is being audio and video recorded. So watch watch what you say. Make sure you're, you're nice to me because it'll be on tape. Um, I would like to say, uh, I would like to start my long, boring speech. Actually, it's not very long, but it is boring. Um, it is your fault, though, for coming to a, a forum on zoning. Um, but I think it's important to kind of explain uh, what we're dealing with here um, in detail before we get started. Um, this is a case where I hope we can take public comment and translate it into, into public policy. Um, and we're going to be working on an ordinance that, oh, this is very important. If you haven't gotten this uh, handout, this handout on the pick behind uh, you, Bill, um, maybe we can circulate those so everyone has these, these packets. This is the ordinance that we're working on today. Um, the, the goal is to go through this ordinance and explain to you what exactly is in there, what's not in there, and to get comments in as much detail as you want um, about each section. The goal is to create the best law we can with as much public input um, as possible. I would say that the part of the zoning we're dealing with is only one part of all the zoning in, in the city. I get made fun of because I, um, I print stuff out. I don't have an iPad, so I frequently print out stuff to read as opposed to do it electronically, and I printed out the zoning law, and I think I literally killed a forest in doing it because it's like this big. Um, and that's to say that the zoning law is is vast, and you may look at the packet that, I, that is being passed out to you, and you may say, "Well, this is this is great, but there's nothing on there's not enough on on parking, or there's nothing on wetlands protection." Those things are in the code, they're just not in this part of the code. And throughout this forum, I want to be very clear with you what this ordinance does and what, um, and what it does not. And subsequently, where your ideas fit into this ordinance and where they may fit in in a different part of uh, the code. So the actual packet uh, bears some explanation. Um, what you have is actually a a pair of ordinances. There are two ordinances that we're dealing with. Um, one affects the urban residential A, excuse me, urban residential B district, and another affects the urban residential C district. Um, these are the districts I'm talking about. There are three urban residential districts, A, B, and C. A is the least dense, uh, and C is the, the most dense. What we're talking about today is a series of regulations that sit on top of the other zoning codes, the other regulations, that affect large developments that we define as developments of seven or more units in the then two densest residential areas. Um, however, these ordinances are essentially the same. There's very little difference between them, um, and I want to just make sure you, you understand the difference. Um, if you have the packet, you can look in the very back, uh, and that is the ordinance for urban residential B. I've only put one page here because there's only one, one relevant page. Um, I've circled the place 
where this ordinance differs from urban residential C. Essentially, in URB, you can have townhouses, and in URC, um, you can't. And that's the only difference. Um, the back versions of this ordinance are the ordinance as uh, recommended by the planning board. This, this is the version that the planning board actually debated and voted on and passed out. The next, if you keep flipping, the next version are amendments that are, have come after that from the city solicitor and from the planning department. And by the way, I'm, I'm remiss at not pointing out Carolyn Mish, our senior planner, uh, who has also joined us today and will be uh, very helpful um, in this process, I'm sure. Carolyn, uh, you and the planning department suggested subsequent amendments as of the sol uh, solicitor. In the solicitor's case, his ideas were just, so this is a, a good functioning law. But these are amendments that don't, I mean, they exist, but they're conceptual. They haven't been adopted yet. Um, on September 22nd, the ordinance committee is, is scheduled to meet next, and that is when these amendments and everything we're talking about tonight could potentially be adopted. Um, that meeting is also, of course, a public meeting. Okay, and the final version of these is an amendment that, that I've put together, which essentially reorganizes the others um, for the purpose of clarity. I think you should be able to read and understand these uh, without having a PhD in urban planning, um, which, of course, I don't either. Um, and what this amendment does is group each bullet by section. Uh, Buildings, streets and roadways, environment, affordable housing, and so on. So, because it's my forum and Councilor Sheriff says it's okay, that is the, the version that I want to go on uh, today. And it will allow us to take each section by section of a focused conversation about, um, about each, each one. Um, so that is, my, that is my game plan today. Um, I'd like to ask Councilor Sheriff if you have anything else to add at, at the outset. Um, hey, I just, Councilor Donald and I wanted to just take a moment and acknowledge some of the comments that we've gotten from the community. Um, the community has been great and very organized and has been sending us ideas and things that they would like to see um, this uh, this look, you know, these, these changes look like, but also um, more specifically, and some of these are for um, some of the properties that this would affect. So I just want to go through and kind of talk about some of these things that I've been hearing, that we've been hearing. And then as we go through the ordinance, um, we will point out where we think these are being addressed in the ordinance. Um, and then afterwards, let's all have a discussion and see what we all still think needs to be worked on, okay? So I will start with what uh, Councilor donald has been hearing from, mostly from his, oh, this, this came from, so in terms of so what, they, what they respectfully ask for is that there's community engagement and awareness of new zoning considerations via a, a series of public workshops at times when working families can participate. I think we can all acknowledge that that's uh, what we're, we're doing right now is that we're all here having that discussion. Um, consideration of best practices in zoning in comparable cities. Um, here it's recommended Portland. Portland's a much bigger city than Northampton, but um, that they would like to see that we look at what other cities have been doing um, and maybe bring in a consultant uh, to help us with that. Requirement of a special permit and neighborhood oversight of any building over one unit. Um, that I'm not sure we can do, but let's have that discussion. Uh, specificity of language such that there's no confusion in any language in the zoning policy. I think you just covered that. And concern about existing infrastructure um, in Ward 3, the dike, and making sure there's enough green space and permeable surface um, in, in both 3 and 4. Um, and this is in particular in, in regards to climate change and what we all have to look forward to in the future with that. Um, and then a neighborhood group in my Ward, Ward 4, are focused on, in particular, on the Fort Hill, Lyman Hill area and how this is going to affect that. So this is a little bit more specific to that, but uh, what they would like for that neighborhood 
um, is housing density on the 15 buildable acres at Fort Hill, this again is specific for Fort Hill, um, to equal that density that's on in that neighborhood, so along Lyman Road. Um, now, <coughs> that is, when you cross that onto the other side of the street, you actually change to URB, and Fort Hill is URC right now. So that is, there's a difference there, but we can have that discussion about what um, what it would mean to possibly change that back to URB, which is another thing that they want to talk about, um, and how that, if that would really be a significant change. Um, that the height of the buildings there would be consistent with the neighborhood. Most of the buildings in that sort of South Street neighborhood area are two stories. Now, URC is, calls for 50 foot buildings. URB is 35? 35. Um, so that's where there could be a change if you were to change it to URB. Um, preserve a landscape, no build buffer between the trees, uh, with trees uh, between the rear of the properties on Lyman and the, uh, the Fort Hill property. There actually is, I was shown this beautiful grove of trees that are already there. So they would ask that those stay. Um, style of housing that, it's, that fits within the neighborhood. Now that is covered in the design standards. Um, also, so that you will not hear about that tonight in this ordinance. Uh, public access, that it's open and it's not a gated community, um, that there's pedestrian and bike connection um, via the old carriage road that goes down to Fruit Street and also uh, a similar connection to Pleasant Street um, by the dike. A walking path or trail on the non-buildable sections of the property. That property has a large area that's not buildable because of the grade. So they have, and there are already trails there that, that the community uses. They would like to see those preserved. Um, preservation of public space, trees, and historic buildings. Uh, they'd be interested in having a pocket park that the public can also use. Um, preservation of the notable old trees. Um, Lily Lombard, one of my constituents, I don't think is here tonight, but if she were here, she would definitely want me to talk about the fact that um, we need to protect those trees, and if we can, and that we don't necessarily have someone that this in the city right now who's working on that kind of tree preservation. So we need to be mindful for ourselves and make sure that that happens if we can. And uh, we'd like to see that the brick stable and the head servants cottage that are on that property remain. Again, that's something we don't know if that's possible for many reasons, but that's what I'd like to see. And traffic, of course, is probably one of the main concerns um, that main entries are on South Street and that we try and limit the traffic that's on those smaller streets like Lyman and the surrounding community. Um, and that's it. So we, this is what we've heard from you and we're listening. And um, Ryan's now going to go. Can I just say, this is off. Should we turn this on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I turned it off for noise purposes, but it also keeps the meeting shorter. <laughs> uh, but we, we can, what's, this is democracy. Who wants the air conditioner on? Yeah. 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 For a while. All right. Can we, can we get people inside and close the door? No? All right. Tell us if you feel like you can't hear, okay? So never said I never did anything for you. Um, so we've, we've collected these these comments, but more are going to come out tonight. And I hope they can they can find expression as we go through each uh, bullet in the ordinance. Two seats okay. right here. And, and I'd like to pause here because we've been talking for a long time and ask if there's any uh, kind of general questions about what we said so far. For those who haven't seen that map, could you just tell us what uh, areas are the what color? What yep. are areas? So here are the three urban residential areas. Uh, by the way, I'm colorblind, so this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> but around, this is um, purple. Oh, good. It's, it's, it's uh, spelled out. So the purple or pink is URC, uh, yellow is URB, and the green, you know, you get out towards Florence, less dense, uh, that's URN. And I believe everyone has mini versions of these maps as well. So if you want, you can find your own, your own zone. How many stories are 35 feet? And how many are 50 feet? How many stories are 35 feet? We were trying to figure this out the other day. Two and a half to three, for, depending on how it's designed, for um, 35 feet. Um, and then 
statement to say that URA is a rural district. It's not. Yeah, my big chunks of the URA are no at all different than URB. Okay. Part of URC. And some of them particularly are closer to the central. Uh, there are yeah. big chunks of URA that are closer to the to the central business district than are parts of URB. Yeah, that's probably misspeaking on my part. Yeah, URA stands for urban residential A. So yeah, obviously it wouldn't be rural. So that's a good point. Thank you. I think one of the problems is that people don't don't have a concept of what any of these of the numbers mean. So you're talking about 35 feet in units and A and B and C and so forth. And somehow I don't know if we'll be able to learn that in this time. But one of my concerns is, I think other neighbors' concerns is that we talk about what uh, delaying the vote because I think we can see by the questions that will arise that people actually don't have a grasp of what this is about. So I hope on the agenda will be a discussion of how we can use the time between now and the end of the moratorium to um, work together to come up, come up with something that we actually can understand. Because I find this, and I've been to all the meetings, very difficult to process, like sitting here and looking at the maps and hearing these figures. So I hope that's part of the agenda for the meeting. Yep, I think any questions that aren't answered by going through the, the language, we certainly can bring questions up at the end uh, for the sake of clarity. Do you want, we're about ready to, to dive into the actual ordinance. I think that would be the, the best way to, to go about um, Does anyone have something funny? Um, it begins, and this is where I like to ask Carolyn, uh, Carolyn so, um, because what we're talking about are rules for large developments and so there's a process when those rules kick in um, this is the approval process for a special permit that's required in cases of large development of seven or more units um, so carolyn if, if you would i think it would be helpful if you helped us go through the first section before we jump into each of these subsections and explain what's a site plan and what's a special permit um, so, um, to reiterate what Councillor O'Donnell uh, mentioned previously, this is really just sort of a bit of the entire zoning ordinance, and so I want to explain a little bit about the sort of bigger picture about um, what you've got in front of you. Section 1 talks about a distinction between um, site plan approval versus special permit. And this is just a, a little snippet of the total list of, of um, uses that might be allowed in these districts, but any district in the city. Um, but we have a series of um, uses for each district that um, either are allowed by right, meaning you don't need any further approval, you just need to get a building permit, 
or um, whatever other permits you might need to conduct what you want to do on a piece of property. And then the next level of potential review is what we call site plan review, which means you need more than just an administrative review. You need to come to um, the planning board to have a review of how your site functions, um, how vehicle and pedestrian traffic enters the site, um, what kind of landscaping, what kind of lighting, and those um, elements, what your what potentially what your traffic impacts are. And then we have um, a third threshold of review, which is also by the planning board, um, and it just sort of to add on to the site plan. Site plan is really about technical details about a property and how it functions. The third level of review is a special permit, and that is a discretionary permit. The planning board can say that a permit, a special permit, should not be granted for any number of reasons. It's not, it's not a technical review. It includes some technical aspects, but it also includes other um, um, review aspects that deal with um, compli or, um, compliance with character of the neighborhood or whatever other specificity is identified in the zoning about certain uses that might trigger special permits. So um, in, um, which there's not in, in this list here because we're not talking about that kind of special permit, but in, um, you know, there, there are certain uses like a lodging house or nursing homes that need special permits. So the planning board would look at that and say, is it appropriate to have a nursing home in this neighborhood, in this portion of this neighborhood even, to get down to that minute detail? And it may be that the application meets certain technical requirements that are also spelled out under the site plan section, but in fact, ultimately, that nursing home doesn't make sense in the middle of that neighborhood. So the planning board has the discretion to say, no, nope, sorry, nursing home okay generally, not okay specifically in this area. So those are the three types of reviews. Um, and, and so what you've got in front of you is just, um, the portions of the list of what's allowed by site plan versus what's allowed by special permit because those are the portions that are up on the table for discussion. And, um, the, and, and the bulk of our conversation tonight is gonna be about those specific special permit criteria that address the creation of seven or more units in the residential um, B and C district. And that is because sort of going back a little bit in time, we um, last September when the whole zoning package for A, B, and C was adopted, there was a conversation and discussion about wanting to get a little more specific about those larger projects that, you know, the first portion of that, uh, those adopted changes were um, okay for unit um, construction of units up to six, but then after that there was, a, there was a, a decision made by counselors that we need to go back, spend a little bit more time on those bigger projects. So um, based on that um, decision in September, um, the seven or more unit threshold is why we're here today and what we're talking about because we've gathered lots of information about what people are concerned about um, throughout the neighborhoods about what should be addressed for those bigger projects. And I, will, I also want to emphasize that we've never had a special permit threshold in the urban residential C district for multifamily or townhouse units. Um, of any size. So it's always been site plan review. It's always been just a technical review. So essentially it's allowed by right, but it comes to the planning board to look at the technical aspects. So in urban residential C, up until September of last year, everything was site plan approval. You could do two units, you could do 30 units on a property. It was always site plan. So what happened in September was instituting a more stringent review for projects that had never been in place before and adding design standards at that time for all projects. One unit to six units and then sort of keeping, putting the moratorium on the seven plus. Um, so this is really sort of a, this is a, a very new step for the city to look at more detailed design characteristics. And that frankly was initiated through the sustainable Northampton process five years ago when we talked about how do we become a more sustainable community? How do we address the housing needs of the community that at that time, five years ago, and that have continued to be um, in need 
moving forward, especially as our um, demographics shift and people's needs shift. And so we've carried that concern about wanting to allow new development in neighborhoods in a more sustainable fashion, but with the caveat that we were gonna add design standards. So um, in September is when we had that first round of package to address design standards for, for units. Now this is sort of the, the next step to focus on the bigger projects um, and get a little bit more detail there. Okay. Before we, before we, we should take some questions on that. How many people have two seats? Three seats. There's available seats. Do anyone want to? We recognize Councillor Lisa Klein, who's also joining us for seven. She's sitting on the ground, so she's an example of us all. Let's let's do the questions and go to the chain. Yeah, um, thank you for the clarification about the site plan, and the special permit process. Um, I have a, just a clarifying question. Do adjacent neighbors get to participate in these? Do adjacent neighbors learn of the um, potential building plan so that they're even aware to go to a planning board meeting? So um, anytime that um, a use is, is determined to be um, not allowed by right, so it might trigger site plan. And in fact, if, if the in the table of use, if it doesn't say you need site plan, but you're building a structure that may be a multifamily or a townhouse unit of four units, but it's more than 2,000 square feet of construction, that also triggers site plan. So you might be allowed to do three units by right in a neighborhood, but it's more than 2,000 square feet of gross floor area, so that would trigger site plan. Anything that triggers either site plan and then also special permit um, goes to the planning board, which means it's a public hearing process, which means that um, all the butters, um, and the butters to a butters that are within 300 feet. So essentially we draw a big circle around that every property boundary and the butters are notified by mail. We have to post it in the newspaper for two weeks and we also require now applicants to post a yellow sign on their property with the agenda and the subject and the nature of the project, um, the, the proposed public hearing. So that's for any project that triggers planning board review. Is there a question on yeah, I just, I'm just trying to follow the chronology because there have been these theoretical maximum densities tossed out. Um, so were the densities set in September? Densities were set last year. Last year. Right. And were they bumped up from prior years? You were they, was the density increased? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, okay, so, so now we're, now this is a discussion about design features at a higher density that has been adopted. These are regulations that, I'm oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. They, they, I mean, is that they, sit on, they sit on top of oh. other parts of the zoning law, including what was done last year to increase density. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and if I may, I mean, I would like to make a, a quick comment on that. And I, I know that there are a lot of people in this room whose primary concern is actually not really the ordinance that's in front of us. Yeah. And I think that's fine. Um, I think, I know people, I, I can, point you out, but I won't, who want to repeal what was passed. Um, and frankly, I, I've kind of struggled with how to approach this. The conclusion I've come to is, I think that is a, a, a broader discussion that I'm not prepared to stand here and throw cold water on. I mean, that's local democracy. If you want to repeal a law that was passed or modify a law, I think that's a legitimate discussion. But during the course of this forum, especially, I, mean, I want to be very honest with everybody what ideas could be accomplished through this ordinance and what would require another one. Um, you didn't like us to, to lie to you or, or pander to you. Um, so we're gonna be we're gonna be honest about that. Because there is a distinction. But that being said, let's get all the ideas out there. Some can be put in here and some need we need a different one. Can I, if I can just follow up on the question about did we increase the density? What we did was we analyzed what had the build out of the neighborhoods historically in those neighborhoods that, and we had lots of conversation about yeah. what that means. So we we changed the zoning to match what was in the neighborhoods. Um, and it happened that over time in the 70s and 80s, there was a big suburban um, dispersion of, of development and lot size requirements. The regulations got much, um, um, bigger than what they had characteristically been in those neighborhoods and this was sort of bringing it back to the way to match how those neighborhoods really were originally built. Yeah, yeah no, I'm just trying to catch up. Right. 
I think this is good so we can be very clear what we're talking about. Any other general comments? Keeping in mind, we haven't even launched into the actual regulations yet, but simply. Is the occupant density, both human and animal, ever taken into consideration in during site plan approval? The number of people who will live in it, or animals who will live in it. Right, because there have been some questions recently about uh, animals, how many um, llamas you can have in your backyard and that kind of thing. So is there any, and also how many people you can have in a unit? I assume this is more of a health kind of question more than a zoning. Well, we, we do have, in another section of zoning, like Councilor Donald mentioned, we, the zoning is so, um, is um, very specific about different um, criteria, and animals are addressed in a different section. Um, we don't allow llamas in the city 30,000 square feet, I think, to the end. People still spit at me, though, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just wanted to follow up on Richard's question just to make sure I understood your answer. So the, the density for uh, more than seven units is already been set, and so now the issue of the design standards that are accommodated in what was passed a year ago for seven or more. So we're really talking about parking, roads, pathways, and things like that, not the basic density for more than seven or less than seven. That, that's correct. The only amendment I make is it applies to any number of things. <laughs> and that's exactly correct. So the amendment I'd like to work on today, the, the Ryan amendment, um, <laughs> I, I really shouldn't attach my name to this. This isn't slightly smart at all. Never mind. Um, does that, those are the sections. Buildings and parking, streets and roadways, um, park space, energy standards, affordable housing, and so on. So yeah, you're, you're right. Those sit on top of the density uh, standards that were set. Bill. Right. I, I, thank you for that clarification. It's very helpful. Do these amendments supersede the density requirements, though? So, for example, if you have to so much space for parking, so much space for open space, so much this or that or the other thing, that made the density impossible, do these take precedence over that? That's a good question. There's another document floating around. I, I don't know if we can get that from Mr. Newman. There's one in the back. But when we talk about density, we're talking about the amount of frontage you need to build something, the amount of square footage you need to build something. URB and URC, we're talking about <coughs> 2,500 square feet per unit. Um, and, and, and distance between the units. And setbacks. So those, yeah, right. So it's density in those terms. And you won't find anything that strictly speaking modifies those numbers in here. You may find a de facto modification. For example, we always have to skip ahead with you. You're so, you're so quick. Uh, you're skipping ahead to the, the parts. Stroking will get you everywhere. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a part, where, at the last form we did, I think it was in March, it was much smaller than this. I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy this is a bigger form. The idea brought, was brought up of what about park space? And I think the original zoning said, let's have park space. But they, I think it was you, Richard, um, said, well, let's, let's make sure we have a certain amount of park space. So now we want to say, have this amount of square footage per unit of park space. So in that sense, yeah, you, you would you would create space that couldn't be developed. But yeah, but that it wouldn't kind of modify the frontage or setbacks or anything like that. I think if I could be add a little bit more to that, I, I think very much so these design standards actually could reduce the total number of units. So your first maximum, you might look and make a mathematical calculation about, oh, on this piece of property, I could get 10 units because I have the minimum lot size for 10 units. But it's you, you determine that based on the requirement for open space or the park space, based on your parking requirements that requires a certain landscaping that's been included in, in this. So you have to break up your parking right. in, in a way that does not create a vast um, amount of asphalt in one space without having it broken up into little bits. I can't accomplish all that and still get my 10 units. I'm gonna to have to back off of 10, maybe I need seven because that's the only way I can fit my parking on the, on the property. So you start, you some, some per, um, prospective developer might start with thinking, you know, looking at the numbers and saying, well, my maximum is this, but then might have to back down off of that based on trying to meet all these other design criteria. Anything else? We haven't even started yet. Well, uh, when the vote is taken, can it, it can it apply to a different number? Could we decide to float the number four units and, and then, because seven isn't set yet, that's, 
what, right. that was the imagined number, but now I think people are saying seven is too many. That is an excellent example of some way that this ordinance could be amended. I'm not saying I support it or don't support it, but yes, that could be any sort of I think you'd have to have another public hearing. You'd have to restart the public hearing process because it was advertised at seven and going back to September, the, the vote was um, for seven being the threshold. So it is possible, but not it through this process. You'd have to go That's back. why we're yeah. advocating to keep going till December. <laughs> but allow me to, to clarify that as well. Um, a couple months ago, we extended a moratorium that was originally going to end on July 1st this year. We extended it to December 31st. So the moratorium is in place until the end of the year. The reason why we're working on this now is because we want something to be in place when that moratorium <coughs> expires. Um, I personally am not willing to bank on another extension. Even if I just want to do it myself, it's not politically um, uh, reliable. And what would happen if we got to the end of the moratorium and we had none of these standards? And suddenly we have to worry about Fort Hill development, Shaw's Motel development without the appropriate uh, standards that we're trying to finalize today. So that's why we're starting this before the end of the year. But just so it's clear, yeah, the moratorium does technically go to December 1st. Carol. I have a quick question following up on um, Councilman Bowman's comment. Um, Council Bowman mentioned that the moratorium no, let, you said, let's say it's 10 units, and then the developer comes in and sees that because of all these design features, he can't possibly, or she can't possibly do the 10. But I don't know how liberal this town is with variance, but if the developer comes in and says, um, I'm promised 10 units, so you have to give me a variance from these other design features. So in other words, what, 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 do these design features really override? In other words, if, you think, if the developer is told, I'm allowed 10 units, then these little design things, you know, are just a nuisance, and I can get the city to give me a variance so that I can get my 10 units. So the time. question is essentially, how easy is it to get a variance from I mean, these, how, do, these how do you write these things in such a way well, I don't know the answer to how easy it's going to be. I assume um, what these rules are what the planning board wants to see. Generally. The state statutes are very specific about when a variance can be granted. A variance is only granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals, so it's a different body. The planning board can't grant a variance. Um, and the Zoning Board can't grant a variance uh, unless there's something unique about the property that prevents the property from being used at all. It doesn't say, you know, it's okay, we're going to give you 10 units because that's what you want. Well, if the, the property- law says, The law says you can have 10 units. Hypothetically, or seven or whatever. <clears throat> no, that's, that's the whole point of these design standards is it's a special permit and you can only get your special permit if you meet these and if the planning board determines that you've met some other general criteria of special permit that says it, you, know, you have to meet all of these specific ones and the board has to determine that that has been done. And so it's just because the, by math, you think you, when you just take a blank piece of property that you can get that number of units, it's that number of units, but also you have to meet all these other things. So it's, it's really a starting place for determining the number of units, but it's not the ending place because you have to make sure you comply with that. And so variances, I would say, no, the board would not legally, technically be able to provide, to grant a variance just so a developer could get one more unit. Variances aren't Two issued because, like, you know, to Bill Newman because he had a great show this morning and we, we really like Bill. There has to be a, a reason, right? They're not just distributed. Well, there, yeah, and there are very specific reasons, <coughs> right. too, that are, uh, that are codified in, in um, state sections. Jim. Brian. So uh, to, to get you your, get to the ordinance here, um, so, are you going to, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, are you going to jump into this, the sections of the ordinance? Yeah, I want to. I would like to do that as well. Are there any other basic questions about, okay, excellent, please. Okay, so um, my, my concern is that when I read this, and maybe I'm missing something, but that the, the, the focus of the design standards is on, from, the, is the project and the way it presents to the street, 
and it becomes much less clear to me as the project goes into the interior. So from, from the street, you may have a structure that looks like the rest of the streetscape, but once you go in, it's, it's not clear to me what kind of streets are there. It's not clear to me how those structures are gonna relate to the surrounding neighborhood. Um, so that, that's my question. Okay, I think it would be constructive to, I, I, will, I just wanna read this thing. And if you have specific amendments that would accomplish some of those, for example, and they pop out for you or anybody, please, please suggest them. Um, so now we're starting the first section of, of the top version, um, uh, A, buildings and parking. So the first part of this is, the first row of buildings along a street shall face the street and add to the streetscape. There shall not be any parking except incidental to a driveway or roadway between the first row of buildings and the street. So in other words, if your parking lot is not in your, in your front yard. Um, parking shall be located behind buildings or designated otherwise to minimize view uh, from the street. So there's no parking on the street? There is parking on the street, yes, but there's no um, you know, parking lot, I guess, <coughs> in, in the front, uh, between the street and the house. Council? I just want to know what adds to the streetscape. That's a good question. Question. What's the question? Oh, sorry. Councillor Adams asked, "How does one know what add, quote unquote, adds to the streetscape?" And I would just say that I think it's part of the, the challenge of, of codifying planning language. You know, um, I think the solicitor has gone through this and actually shaped a lot of the language up that was sort of vague um, into better language. But you are still <coughs> left with these questions. Um, how, how would you? All the language in here that may not seem precise something that is sort of planning speak for better for lack of a better term how how is that interpreted um well i, I think it depends it's project by project it's specific project by project and so that's the discretionary part of the planning board as well is to make that determination so does this project does it contribute to the streetscape is there a transition zone between the public and the private realm and is you know, if a building's back is turned to the street and it's all, and, and everything is oriented in interior to that and it's all sort of blank walls along the street, I would say that doesn't add to the streetscape. So the planning, it's really going to be project by project. So the simple answer is the planning board. I mean, yeah, these are the, I guess right? the, the, the guidelines that the planning board is using when determining whether to grant a special permit. There's a lot of language in the Elm Street Historic District guidelines, which I think really flesh out these concepts of what people might be more or less comfortable with. And an example is the design of a new building should respect the existing proportions of buildings in the district, particularly those of adjacent structures. And there's a lot of phrases like that, which taken as a whole, I think really very nicely capture a lot of concerns of people in this room about big disruptive developments that look really different from everything around it and very disruptive to the fabric of the neighborhood. So I would hope that uh, we can comb through some of that language, which is in force and on the books already on Elm Street, and bring it into you know, some of our other historic neighborhoods. If there are specific um, additions that go in this section, towards one. I want to, uh, with regard to A, what happens if a property has more than one street? Because it says, shall be, shall be in the back, not on the street. What happens if there's more than one street? Does this apply to the property on all streets? Is right, so I think I would argue that that also is sort of one of the things that needs to be considered on a project by project basis. So if you're on a corner lot, we have the same thing for houses that are on corner lots or are through lots because they're, you know, they have a backyard that's on a street and then the front of the house is, is on another street. So I think, again, it's context-based, and so the planning board needs to look at that and say, how are all those facades, you know, um, 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 in character or, or providing um, a presence on the street that is not, you know, that's consistent with the neighborhood. So, so this, but the intention is to allow the planning board to have the discretion to, in fact, say, put a large parking lot on one of the streets if the property is on two streets? 
I no, I thought you were talking more about building facades at that building point. I didn't know you were talking about. But A says the first row of buildings along A Street shall face the street edge of the street. Street, street scale. There shall not be parking except so on between the first row of buildings and the street. Parking shall well be located behind buildings. So it can be behind one building on one street and on another street. So my question is, does this is this intended to say there will not be the parking on because this runs through this ordinance on any street? I think that's the intention. Is a public street you need to have buildings front the street and not a, a parking lot because that's not the character of these neighborhoods. That's not how these neighborhoods were built out. So you have to come up with some design that addresses that um, in, yeah. in a way that that's uh, appropriate for that particular site. And I'd also say it ends otherwise minimize the view from the, the public street, which to me kind of encapsulates the tension. Um, test. And I would just say to us planning board member that I don't think any of us can interpret that statement to suggest, you know, this possibility that they're parking on the street. You know, the people who are on the planning board, you know, have a variety of expertise. They've been vetted and our goal is to make sure that, that the planning documents like sustainable Northampton are realized in those you know site plan reviews and special permit reviews. So I think you know we've gone over this quite a lot within the planning board to make sure that you know the intent is understood that when you know when there's a street, whether it's a, you know whether you've got two streets or one street, the, the goal of the streetscape is the same. I would like to suggest that we go a little bit further through the buildings and parking section and I imagine there'll be other street questions. So, and then, and can we do more questions after we go to the planner? Just to be conscious of time. Can we just have two questions really fast? So we want to be really quick. You want two questions? Just quickly, is there any specificity about number of parking spots per unit? I think that needs to be a really specific moment. Okay. It says not more than two. I think it probably should say um, each unit equals two parking spaces. And that's an example of something that resides in part of the zone. Okay. And then one other quick question I had is, um, and this may be part of the planning board process, but case in point, what Bill was saying about Shaw's Montel, abuts two streets, um, two rather major streets, Pomeroy, which is a cut through, and Main Street, which is a school you know, area in the morning. Do public access and public safety considerations come into these discussions as well? And is it specified here in this ordinance? It's generally a part of the site, the general site plan approval criteria that's already part of the zone. I mean, I think, of course, public safety is, is part of the equation. There's no specific public safety language in this, no, in, in this particular ordinance. It doesn't mean it's not part of what we do. As part of site plan review, there um, there are various departments in the city that review these. One of the, the fire, police, DPW, all look at it from with their lens. And it's part, the, the, the language in the site plan review criteria in another section of zoning covers that and requires that. All right. I, I must insist I, I read a little bit more before we take more questions because it's quarter of seven. We're only on A1. Um, so the second part is the area between the property and the road pavement shall be uh, made to be pedestrian friendly with sidewalks, street furniture. And by the way, for anyone who lives on North Street, that does not mean the old abandoned couch that was left here. <laughs> yes, I'm going to get rid of it. I think it's a fancy word for bench. Um, street furniture, trees, and other vegetation, all of which shall be in conformance with city standards. All landscaping incorporated as part of the applicant's design between the street and the building shall facilitate and enhance pedestrian use of sidewalks and other areas adjacent to the building. Such so streetscapes uh, may include rebuilding by the applicant as necessary, uh, granite curves, ADA compliant concrete sidewalks, tree belts, drainage improvements, appropriate road impact development standards, any necessary drainage improvements triggered by this change. So these are further things that you, uh, that the, the planning board is looking uh, to be in these projects. Um, and those are good things. Um, number three, buildings that abut existing residential properties shall incorporate building articulation along side facades. Building projections shall be incorporated for any facade that is longer than 30 feet. Um, this bears explanation. I, I had to ask Carolyn um, what this meant. I should probably just defer to her, but I'll, I'll give it a, a whack anyway. What we're trying to avoid is long, featureless, uh, you know, windowless brick buildings that are just facing each other. A 
building projection, for example, it might be a bay window that comes out. Um, it's just another design feature, so the neighborhood looks a little nicer. That's what that means. Um, and finally, number four, front facades shall have setbacks consistent with other buildings within the block or provide a different setback that's necessary to address any natural resource constraints. This is kind of what Adam was beginning to talk about with um, um, the Elm Street Historic District. And only in this case, it's referring to a rhythm of, of the buildings lining up so you don't have one house here, the next house all the way back here, and then so forth. Um, that's what that does. So that's section A. Any, any further questions on buildings and parking? Great. So um, I want to talk about trees. So since we don't have a tree warden, I'm wondering how would a tree belt be approved so that trees were properly sited um, you know, and appropriate species are, are sited so that these trees thrive and they don't become disruptive to utilities and things like that? That's a good question. Short answer is I don't know. Do you know? We have um, a specific um, criteria for street tree plantings, and um, it's in the subdivision rules and the planning board, and actually it's referenced in the zoning as to, so whenever street, tree, um, street trees are required to be planted, and it's, it's um, almost every project that the planning board reviews, even today, commercial projects, residential projects. Um, so we have a list of species that are approved as um, um, appropriate for a street um, situation where you've got sand and salt build up. So we have those standards in place. I think we generally agree we, we could do better with trees. Generally, I think you know, the tree work would be, would be nice. I just wanted to ask a quick question about what a block means. So I think, for instance, with the Shaw Motel, it's pretty clear what a block might be, but in a larger development, when there's a possibility of creating new blocks, is this internal consistency in what's being built, or does it really relate also to the neighborhood and getting back to the Elm Street? You said it starts to touch on sort of the, the language in the Elm, Elm Street area, but it's not clear to me that for a large uh, piece of property, say like the Lehman, whether that just means within whatever's built there, there might be blocks and it's internally consistent, or is it consistent with what exists on the Lehman? My, my guess is the intention is it's, the, it's, it's specific um, to the actual place, right? It's, I'm not sure if there's a mathematical definition of block. Well, I think, you know, Lyman is certainly a unique situation because it's such a big piece of property. Um, we've had separate conversation and we've had, you know, a public forum just on the Lyman estate parcel and sort of how we can move forward with that. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about sort of continuing that grid pattern to the extent we can that's already um, you know, in that um, neighborhood on the on that side of South Street. Um, so we get further that um, Councilor Donald's going to read those requirements for um, when you are incorporating new streets. And but I think the idea is you're looking, um, you'd be looking at the context of where your building is going. And so if it means taking the context of the surrounding neighborhood, there are lots of different. Um, kinds of buildings and structures in the South Street neighborhood. They're not all single families. There are, you know, and, and so there's, the, I think the idea is that um, you would build from that. And, and again, it goes back to sort of planning board looking at that. Are you, are you meeting all these design criteria and, and how does it flow and connect to the existing neighborhood? Because those are some of the criteria that come next that Council Don is going to go through is sort of how, how you make that transition. Um, in uh, number 200 buildings and parking, where it says the area between the property and the road pavement shall be made to be pedestrian friendly, blah, 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 <coughs> in other specs. It's unclear to me if this is the main street that's being built off of or all roads within the property. Is this interior or exterior? Um, when we get to the next section, um, more what we said about that, my hope is that it's the interior as well. Mine too. Yeah, no, I think that's. I, I think the goal is to have sidewalks that connect to other sidewalks and no sidewalks to nowhere. You know, with the goal of having a streetscape and city blocks. Um, but I think that's important. Yeah, just to, well, to follow up on that, in, in our neighborhood, as you know, there's some streets that don't have any sidewalks. Um, or they have a sidewalk on, I, I should say they have a sidewalk on one side but not on the other. And um, 
I guess, you know, we're wondering at some level how if, if there's a development going in, they could build sidewalks, but if there's a deficiency of them in the neighborhood or in there and poor repair, um, what kind of mitigation could happen to, to help that, to really truly encourage the pedestrians to not only use the sidewalks within the development, but to go downtown? For example, my understanding of traffic mitigation, and correct me if I'm wrong, is um, developers will pay into a fund that can, one of the legitimate uses of traffic mitigation is the construction of sidewalks. Am I wrong with that? Okay. I guess part of the issue, though, is land. You know, right. is, is, if somebody owns land all the way up to the, to the road, um, it would require taking land on some of these streets, like William Street, for example. You know, um, and that seems... In a hypothetical situation that you're thinking about. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking in the end about how cramped these streets are, basically, and how difficult it would be to improve some of that. Yeah, I mean, my hope is that sidewalks wouldn't be, you know, foisted on on the neighborhood that we benefit from. That would be part. Of, I mean, you know, not not in any way make light of what you're saying. I I think it is very specific in each case. I don't know if I can answer your question. Well, no, I guess I'm, you know, I'm I'm just thinking of the whole. I get fixated on traffic and trying to improve pedestrian access to downtown. And I can see it being designed into the developments here, but how it connects to the other, the existing infrastructure is the challenge of it. Okay, well, I mean, that's a legitimate point that um, I'm happy to, to talk more about how that works with this ordinance, um, especially with the goals, for sure. Um, any questions, Mike? Yeah, to, to build on what he said, um, it seems to me there ought to be a, a certain point of threshold where increasing the density of the infrastructure that the streets are not big enough and the traffic is fairly heavy. Um, <coughs> what, what, is there something in there that's going to stop, it, say, no, you can't put the development in here because it's just not the infrastructure? Well, um, I think I think it's principally uh, governed by the density rules, right? How much you can build. Um, yeah, one of the evaluations is um, traffic, um, and it's in the ordinance currently, and how you might address that. There are many ways to address pedestrian safety if that's the issue or um, speeds. Um, we also know that. Part of the, I mean, part of the issue and part of the interest in trying to um, allow for um, new housing in areas that are close and walkable to services and schools um, is that people will not be using their vehicles as much. And we know that there's a trend that people don't want to have um, cars where they live, and they want to live in places where they don't need to rely on their cars. So there are a whole number of things that you know get evaluated in that context and, and if you can build sidewalks where there's existing right-of-way that's one way to address pedestrian safety but there are other ways to address pedestrian safety that don't necessarily you know particularly if the right-of-way doesn't um isn't large enough to incorporate and, and the sidewalks. Uh, part of your question may also be addressed again when we get to this next section which describes some of the infrastructure requirements for building street so. i have one quick question Everybody has quick questions. Everybody has quick questions too. Um, uh, the, the planning board used to have pre-approval sessions, private sessions. Um, I think they were called Wednesday morning meetings with the developers, in which you had two or three people from the planning board and meet with the, you know, um, <coughs> the engineers and architects. Do they still have that? We don't have, we've never had pre-approval. Approvals are only done in the public hearing context. We do a staff advisory. review to look at plans. Um, we do have a review to look at plans to ensure that the design is moving forward consistent with the regulation. So you don't come to public hearing with something that's completely inconsistent with the ordinance because that's a waste of everybody's time. So right. we do do those initial reviews. But those, those meetings are not public. They are they are public. We are any are they of them. posted? We don't post them because they don't fall under the um, uh, public hearing notice requirements. Right. 
Um, so I, I want to take more questions. I also want to talk about streets and roadways, sec, section B. Is it, is it okay if I move on to that? Please. Please. Could, I, could I just ask a question building on these questions about um, what's traffic and with, you know, in an older neighborhood that already has narrow streets, when new development comes in, for example, in Lyman. So, um, you know, obviously within the development, the language covers how that how traffic would be addressed. But I'm wondering when, you know, in the context of the older neighborhoods that are already, where the streets are already not really adequate for the traffic that's on them, um, how, where in the language does, is that addressed? Um, well, <coughs> let's, let's get into this reason row, row okay. section. If, if that may be illuminated, it may not be, and we can come back to it if it's not. But let's, if that's okay. I think that might be helpful. And just one other yeah. comment, I think. Do, do, um, do, you, do you mind? Do you mind? Okay. I mean, just, I'm sorry. Unless it's really just brief. Well, well it is brief. I just wanted okay. to say that I think that it's not realistic to think that people, because they live close to downtown, are automatically going to walk more. It's it's great idea, but I I, I think realistically, every every unit has two cars attached to it. I, I think I think that's fair. It's Western Mass people are plus. I absolutely agree. Um, I also agree that it's important to encourage walkability, but we're not pretending that cars are, are going away. I think that's a good, a good point. Um, and you know, I'm sorry for rushing through all this. I do it because it's kind of a collective interest in, in going through it as well. I know everyone has individual questions. If we get to the end of this and there are individual questions, I mean, I'm going to stay here. Um, Council Sheriff's going to stay here to, to take them. So, um, so B, streets and roadways. Uh, number one, projects shall connect uh, to all surrounding neighborhoods with bicycle and pedestrian access to the extent possible. This is two subsections. Um, A. For projects that have more than one vehicular access, driveways and roadways shall entirely and externally connect to each other, and dead-end streets shall be avoided whenever possible. <coughs> dead-end roadways and driveways shall never exceed 500 feet, and must include a bicycle or pedestrian connection from the dead-end uh, street to another street, to a common area, part of the city space. The second subsection of this is the projects that have one vehicular access, and this is something I think does speak to Fort Hill, because we already talked thinking one of the important factors for, for Fort Hill alignment state is the number of entrances and egresses into the development. So perhaps all the traffic does not just go down. Uh, so for projects that have a singular vehicular access, such access shall not exceed 500 feet, it's essentially dead end, um, and pedestrian access shall also be provided directly <coughs> from any street to residential units. So instead of one big parking lot and one watch the house. Um, this next section, uh, oh, okay, well, I mean, okay, okay. Dude, I'm, I'm kind of wondering though, I mean, I'm just kind of wondering about, should I just read the entire section, yeah. or is it useful to stop at these numbers? It's useful to stop. Okay, so, uh, all right, <coughs> on that part A about, must include bicycle pedestrian connections to dead end street, it, it would be nice if there was actually a, some sort of public safety review or exception because there's there's cases where you can have a basically a footpath mm -hmm. and there's a lot of crime associated with that footpath if it's secluded mm -hmm. and it's, it's a little bit of a case by case review but I'm concerned that if that perspective isn't represented because it could be a big deal in some cases. Okay. So people need to put a little thought into that safety part. I think that's a good comment. Anything else on this section? Yeah. Uh, if uh, public footpaths right away could be a little signage identifying that they're open to the public. <laughs> that it's a public Even if they're not. Um, I, I think it's an interesting question when how much access public the public does have to some of these right of ways. Um, I think it's a complex subject that probably is also case by case. But I agree in, pl in places where it's absolutely public signage. Um, okay. Um, two, this is this is kind of left over from last year. Um, the design standards for the length of dead end streets, protection of natural features, sidewalks, wheelchair ramps, landscaping, utilities, 
and the construction method and materials for water lines, sanitary stores, storm sewers, fire protection, sidewalks, fiber roads, and other infrastructure shall be those set forth in the subdivision of land chapter, which is another <coughs> part of the code governing subdivisions. Um, these standards shall apply even for private roadways and driveways that are not part of the subdivision unless we apply the planning work. This gets, I think, a little bit um, to Mike's question about uh, infrastructure. And as we build these developments, are we going to have pretty good infrastructure to accompany them? And I think that is the goal. Um, this section. Well, what would that mean? Rebuilding the roads in the neighborhoods and the sidewalks? Like, so if you're going to put something into, say, Henry Street, mm -hmm. that Henry Street needs to be widened? I mean, what are you saying? That this, that I, can you I'm not necessarily saying that. So if you build, build a new road, that's the appropriate infrastructure, just like if you're building a, a private subdivision. That's that's all this is. I think I think the whole frustration is that that the, the development will have very nice roads and sidewalks, and the people will come out into like the rubble of the neighborhood. And you know, it's it's already so, and it connects to the whole density discussion. We're talking about what is density and how do you measure it and so forth, and how many people of ready or trying to get through on these roads that are basically in the winter one lane highways or if somebody's parked on the road it's not already a one lane road and so somehow this issue that Matt brings up and, and others about the sidewalks and the roads is critical to the whole issue of whether we allow seven or one or zero I mean and I feel like this is something that needs to really be flushed out I, I would just say that I mean I think if you look at the numbers for the last 10 years, the population of Manhattan is in fact getting smaller by a little bit. Yes, but we're but talking that, about adding more stuff in. I just wanted to That's right. But even though we're getting smaller, I still support infrastructure and food. So I think we should, yes. we should fix our sidewalks and fix our roads and all the infrastructure all across. <laughs> and some of it was very old, and that's why we did the stormwater stuff. Sorry. Um, but you know, it, it, it's, it's a case where there's, there's less and less resources from the state government and federal government to do critical things that must be done, but I absolutely agree that we should do it. I, I sort of separate it mentally from development, though. Whether we have development or don't, and we should be fixing our, our that, That's my opinion, and um, okay. constant focus. Well, I just want to comment oh, as, sorry, as, a, as a resident of Fruit Street, where we have a, a driveway connection to Salvo House, we have a doll house at one end, we now have a senior center at one end, we have KL Apartments, which is not like the houses on the street. Um, we certainly don't have two cars per household in Salvo or Cahill. Um, it's uh, a road that's often in poor condition and not well paved. We have a bus route on our road. Driving, I, I just accept that living downtown means it's crappy for me to get out of my street and onto my street because I don't think that's going away. We might be one of the densest areas. We have a lot of people living there. We have people walking in the street all the time. It's certainly challenging, but I guess um, I know people are afraid and concerned, and that's why we're here. And I'm not coming from that place. I just feel like it's hard to have a voice to say, well, you know, some of us are living with that. And um, and as someone who's involved in housing development for a nonprofit, I I am not in Northampton. I am mindful of there are many, many people who cannot afford to live in the city, and so any increase in housing will make it easier for everybody who doesn't already own or live, or it increases the tax base. So I know people are very fearful, but I'm mindful of the lumberyard project that's potentially coming, and the hop housing project of the, of the lodging house, and I think these are excellent developments for our city, and what a rare opportunity to bring people downtown who actually probably won't have cars. At, at, at least at, at the lodging, there will be minimal vehicles, I think, compared to, you know, what we're thinking on my single family home or a high-end condo. I think not not everybody who will move into town will be uh, middle class or upper middle class people who can afford a vehicle. I think it's an important comment. Just the fact that so many people have these quick little questions and, and the fact that you know, you're talking about the time that we just don't have and we have to move along, I think belies the fact that we still need more time and that how critical this is. I mean, that's a question we're raised another question, one or two more questions with me. Can they eminent domain property now for sidewalks, for infrastructure? Is that an automatic? Is that a given? With, with old guidelines, new guidelines, or, or both? Domain. Yeah, can, I mean, if they, need, if they need for requirements of these new developments, 
more infrastructure, especially pedestrian friendly or whatever. They I mean, they're named the front of your strip to put in a sidewalk that there isn't one. I mean, I, I guess I'm not contemplating that as a likely outcome. And typically, what we've done, traffic mitigation is required for projects that, um, that show through analysis that there will be. Um, um, a, a demand or increased traffic um, beyond the previously existing conditions. Um, every um, time that the planning board has approved a project that um, requires traffic mitigation, that goes into address issues um, within the, the area of influence essentially for the project. Um, and uh, we've had neighborhood forums just around how do we best utilize this money? And there hasn't been one situation where the city has um, taken uh, more right of way than what was already there to, to to do that. I think the whole the whole idea about the, the um, implementation of that traffic mitigation is to work with the neighbors to see where does this best work. So to move on to the final part of this, this road sir. Um, three. Uh, Driveways and private roadways. By the way, we say that because we want similar amenities, whether it's public or, or private, in many cases. Um, driveways and private roadways shall be designed to function as private alleys or shared streets with pedestrian and cyclists and engineered to keep speeds below 15 miles per hour or yield streets with separate sidewalks as shown in the subdivision regulations we just talked about. Um, so sidewalks shall connect um, along to other sidewalks along adjacent streets. That last sentence was something we added after the last forum because again, we don't want sidewalks nowhere, we want connecting the sidewalks. But this is actually something I would like your opinion on because there are two visions of what a street is as described here. And one is a new idea, the idea of a, of a shared street which doesn't necessarily have a sidewalk. But it's, it's one where people in cars sort of <laughs> are thought to coexist more harmoniously, I guess, um, at low speeds. Um, and that's something that I hope you think about and study. Um, if not today, maybe come back with comments later. But that's one vision of streets that would be in here that is new. Jim. So, um, number two and number three, it's not clear to me when the project's going to require a road and when driveways or shared streets are okay. That a, I mean, City Council, DPW, you guys have been looking at this issue around what's a street and what's a private way and all of that kind of stuff. That I think that should be clear as to what those, you know, trips per day, whatever it is, uh, to say, oh yeah, you can put in an alleyway or a shared street, or you really need to put in a roadway. Um, and then the second thing that relates to the roadway is the, um, if somebody puts in a roadway, do they now have to adhere to the, the zoning on the books that the rest of us have to around the streetscape? So, yes. The answer is yes? Well, that one's yes. Okay, good. <laughs> but yeah, then but having that threshold clear, because, yeah. you know, 12 <clears throat> trips and okay, you get to have a driveway. 30 trips, you need to put in a roadway, and then and what I like about that is it starts to bring together all of the other work that we've done around, you know, that all of, you know, Dennis and everybody else in the room, they open up the, the zoning and it's got the, you know, what the streetscapes look like and the, the setbacks and all of those things. Having the road defines all of that stuff. And I, what, I, what I think is instructive about your comment is not just the substance, but the fact that we are, we do have a limited amount of time here and we, we are trying to find ways to improve this law, but at a certain stage, we need like language, like concrete suggestions of how that would be done. I'm not saying you can't, I'm just saying I don't know the language, but I'd be interested in, in getting some of these, these ideas like when this road threshold would be triggered, and then we can debate it kind of up or down, you know, but I, mean, I don't think that is an illegitimate thing to debate at all about roadways. If I could just add to that, I think part of that is the discretionary permit piece. It's a case-by-case -case basis, so you can't predetermine when it may be appropriate for a driveway versus an alley versus another type of street. And we're actually moving away from um, um, trip generation to determine what type of system or infrastructure we have. 
and we're looking that the idea is we want to create streets or driveways that are that are consistently um, designed to be at low speeds so that they're um, safe for all modes on the network so cars bicycles scooters people in wheelchairs walkers the whole range i'm curious how they've done this in other cities this is the of reinventing the wheel how have they done it elsewhere very well studies and you must have these studies so somebody must have these studies but how can we see of course we think of all kids who are City, the Elm Street District is a good one look at. Um, but I think your point is well taken that there's a wealth of information out there, and I think a lot of it has been looked at and created. Um, I don't think we designed it in the vacuum, but I think your point it, it's true. You can always learn from others. I mean, for what that's worth. But yeah. um, we have three little sections left, um, so if there are a few, I'd like to jump into them. Um, the next is park space. This grew out of, as I say, the last four we um, see park space. All projects shall include a park common area, fully designed and constructed to be integrated into the project, which is easily accessible and available for residents of the street. Uh, at a minimum, the space should be 100 square feet or 10 square feet per dwelling unit, a buildable area, whichever is greater. So think about Fort Hill. Um, it would be nice to have kind of a central civic space or park that is kind of accessible in general to the neighborhood as a whole. Um, uh, just a quick point on that. Um, uh, Attorney Seawald was at one of the meetings with us. He made it very clear that this is not public space. This would be private space. It says so. Right. It says so in here. He read it as residents of the street. But it says here available for residents of the project. Yeah. That's true. Just point of clarification. It's not public. It's private. Oh, that's accurate. In fact, an amendment that I suggested was that you could have wiggle room on that if you made it available to the public in perpetuity. And then the solicitor said that was unconstitutional. So now the Constitution gets what you can. Um, but no, it's technically right. It's a private development. Um, I like to think that if we think about something specific like Fort Hill, <coughs> that in theory we might be able to influence that. To It's not an uncommon thing to wind up with in you know, a public park space. Anyway, that's an, an important thing. Any other comments on, on parks? Um, who's having a great time? Tony. Okay, good. That's one. That's not bad. Um, the environment and energy. Um, building shall meet one of the following environmental standards. There's two ways to meet this environmental standard. You meet it the first way by being a home energy rating system uh, at least 25% lower than the current stretch code at the time the special permit is requested. So Massachusetts is one of these states that allows um, communities to, um, when, rather Northampton has adopted the, the stretch code and part of the stretch code is energy standards. So we're just saying you have to be a little better than what's normally expected for that, those standards. Or you have to be a U.S. Green Building uh, Council lead, you know, gold or neighborhood development gold certified one. So, please. Um, I noticed that the um, old version of this ordinance, the uh, draft, the early draft, that it was, uh, well, that this, this current draft is, is down, it was, it was 45, uh, down from 45 less, it's 25 percent, down from 45 percent less. What does that mean? Less is better. Less is better? Um, I just, to wrong? clarify, it was 45, the PERS rating, it was, the language was based on a specific oh, number a rating, and this is right. taking out the number so that it, so that the standard continues to change as the stretch code changes for the um, home energy rating system um, rating. So we're always a little bit. Right. No, I, excuse me. I, you know, I, I question that first because you know, there's a new energy code going into effect, or it is in effect, that has greatly increased the energy you know, saving requirements, and. As you know, having a stretch code community and having 
enacted the new stretch code if we decide to take one. And I'm not sure if they're going to have an increase to a stretch code on the new requirements. But I think to, re to have to reduce your energy use 25% between the new standards is like reaching for a pie in the sky. I mean, one that would make the cost of the construction exorbitant. And at some point, it's it's not even a payback when I mean, you get to that stringent energy standard. You know, I mean, I think you know the, the, the lead construction potentially is a better use or I don't know. I, I just, as a builder, I just find the energy codes are really hurting the consumer, and to go 25 percent more than the requirement. So, it's like so as a out. builder, as a builder, could I ask you, in your opinion, you have a choice between A and B. So you could just do a lead um, gold certified building. Well, unfortunately, there are different issues too. Which lead has to do with you know sustainable materials and stuff. They're really two different issues. Yeah, but the uh, way it's written out, for better or worse, through the options. So. What are you, what's your opinion on the lead part? Well, um, you know, the gold standard is the highest. I mean, he made for one of the, is the highest, but, but you could do a lower than a gold standard. And I, I just don't, I think the, the, this ordinance should just say, should meet the energy, you know, the uh, building, uh, the energy code requirements. I, I think 25% is asking way too much of a okay. developer, considering the I, yeah. no, really I, I, big increase in the energy codes that just went to a Yeah, and I, I think it's a, it's a good point. I, I'm not a developer, and um, yeah, I guess I would need to see more data on that before having my own opinion. But okay, I mean, it's good to know that's your opinion as, as a builder. As a um, anything else on energy? All right, here's the final pretty much the final section, affordable housing. Um, the building shall meet one of the following standards. This is just like the other one. You meet one of them, not both. Um, first, contain, or 10% of the units um, shall be affordable uh, as defined by definition of affordability, which is, tell me, so she can help me. Um, it is 80% of the, of the of area immediate income. So basically, it's an affordable unit, um, and if you have a 10 unit project, one of them has to be uh, set aside for affordable housing. Um, why? If we have because seven, of them, we need to. Have half the group? No, you can round up. <laughs> or you cut the people in half. <laughs> um, but um, but I, I mean, I think the goal here is we want affordability in Northampton. We also don't necessarily want to segregate that affordability in one part of town. I think we want, when we're building large developments, I think part of it. Um, should be affordable to, that's the goal. Yeah. How do you deal with that thing that was just brought up that not everything's divisible by 10? I think you would round up. Mm -hmm. So I think you could also write it minimum of one. Is that, is that fair to say? That is, and there's also an option here. So you don't necessarily, if, if that option doesn't appeal to you, there's the option of providing smaller units. Right, that's B. So that's the idea behind that. If you build something smaller, in theory, it's more affordable. Up to, yeah, but know. that's dealing with the ambiguity by stepping aside rather than dealing with the changing it so it's more usable. You understand what I mean? I don't understand what you mean. What I'm saying is if you have a 10%, okay, and you got a smaller size, seven units, mm -hmm. seems there's a way to write that. So in fact, it carries like a minimum. Okay, right, so you prefer to say a minimum of one or 10 percent, which is whichever is great. Right. All right, that's great. I, I like it. Let me express my opinion. Julie, can we go after Tony's or Tony? So I just wonder why option B is here under this subheading of affordable housing because it doesn't really mean anything, and it sort of gives the option of not having any of it. And I just wonder if you can speak to the intention of section E being here and why there is a, sort of a, a opt-out because I think we know based on recent developments in the city, Millville, um, as an example, that 1,200 square foot units can sell for $350,000 and that's certainly not anything that we would call affordable. So, you know, the, the unit, it's, you know, there's folks who work in this world and know this, there's capital A affordable and lower A and I can't tell what this means to me. I know that the A 
part of this subsection is talking about something very specific, and then we have this opt out of B. So what, why is this section E here? Right, I mean, I think that's a valid point. Yeah. Um, like I said, yeah, the idea was to go to smaller and make more market rate affordable, but your point is absolutely correct. It's not necessarily true. So it doesn't perhaps necessarily satisfy the affordable housing. I don't know if I'm asking there. I mean, it's nice to have it there, but I'm just curious. Right. Oh, yeah. sorry. I just want to um, fill in some of that. Um, there's been a, first of all, going back to sustainable Northampton, there was a lot of discussion about the housing gaps that we have. And it's not just the big affordable, which is really addressing the subsidized housing, which is 80% or less of area median income. But there's this whole range of housing that we're not seeing come on the market, which is for people who are, have been working for many years and they can't either move into Northampton where they work or want to be or what have you, or they, um, um, a, or the units are just too big and therefore too expensive. So there's this whole other range that we're not meeting. We're really good, we as a community, for creating gigantic, big, expensive houses and subsidized affordable housing because we have great nonprofits in the community that do this stuff and they do it regularly. So there's a gap, and that's and we've known that. We've had a housing needs um, assessment done to say that we're not. We're, there are several areas of housing um, need that are not being met for. Um, also, a changing demography. People who are single um, have one kid or two kids, or um, um, you know don't have any kids or what have you. So there's this whole discussion about we we need more than just the big homes and the affordable homes. We also need everything in between. And so this is really to get at. The, um, and, and in fact, going back to January, February, when we had a forum um, specifically targeted at the um, line in the state, there was a lot of um, um, discussion and agreement that we need to try to encourage smaller housing types. And so this is really specifically evolved out of that conversation. So how do we get to making sure in a special permit process that we can get, you know, there are a whole bunch of goodies that the city wants to get to meet the goals of sustainable Northampton. And so one of them is trying to continue to integrate um, uh, subsidized affordable housing into projects, but also encourage different size, different scale housing. So that's how it came. And I agree, there's been a lot of discussion about labeling as affordable housing. And I think maybe the category could be changed because affordable housing is definitely has this definition of meat of that 80% area median um, income. So we could certainly change the category, but I think there's been a lot of conversation of trying to meet both of those goals. Yeah. Can I just get a point of clarification for a second? So these proposals are then used for, in seven units or greater, they, they have, have to get a special permit and then a site plan, correct? Right? So these are the standards to be used for the site. For the special permit. For the special permit, not the site. Okay. So if, if this then is subject to interpretation, then if we have standards like this affordability <laughs> standard that maybe the committee agrees on when they go to give the special permit, can't you, given the appropriate language for the goals that you're trying to obtain, can't you then interpret it specifically for that development? In other words, if your goal is to have affordable, affordable housing and it's let's say 10 units and you want at least one market value or one affordable unit in that, then can't you specifically, when discussing it with the developer, use those parameters? I mean, what, what, if, if you craft the proposal with the proper language, then it can be interpreted in the instance that the person is coming to you for the special permit, right? Are you, are you making, just ask you, are you saying that um, the option of A and B creates, um, makes it vague or unclear? Well, I understand system. what you're saying about the goals of affordable housing, and I guess, the objective then, from my point of view, would be to make the language such that you can achieve that objective when you are, you know, faced with a situation with this giving a special permit. I, I think that's the point of this. I think if I understand you correctly, the whole, all of these A through um, E that we're right. talking about are specific um, criteria that must be met when right. someone's applying for a special permit for the creation of seven or more units. So, right. um, and. Um, so this housing goal is, or the housing goal 
I guess is um, the intention is that through special permit we can capture, we can start to eat away at some of that demand through this. So I but do you see, the, I mean, can we make, or can the language be made such that your goal is, you know, stated in there and then I guess in the exact instance when you're giving the special permit, yeah. that's a dialogue that goes on with the particular if, if I mean, you, I, need to, you, need this, you need specificity about that. So I think the right. goal overall, we have dozens of goals in the state of Old Northampton, right. and these are just a few regulatory techniques to, to get at some of those goals. So I think it, because it's an ordinance, we don't necessarily state each goal within the context of the ordinance because they're elsewhere. They're in the sustainable right. Northampton plan. And I, I guess I interpret your question at a more simple level. Um, I mean. I think the language could certainly be clarified and improved a So it is clear. Right. I mean, I'm just seeing a distance between what's stated here and the goals that you're actually stating, you know, about that middle, not subsidized housing and not expensive housing, but that middle. So I guess if that's your goal, then let's, you know, somehow, I mean, when I read this, I don't, I don't get to, you know, what you just described as what you're actually going for. Well, I, I guess I there's no guarantee that the, I mean, that, you know, um, as was mentioned previously, there's no guarantee that a smaller unit is going to um, fit someone in the range of 80 to 150 percent of their median income, or whatever the number is. But we also know that despite price, we want these different sized structures. Right. So um, that I, th I think everyone happen. is saying pretty much the same thing. I mean, it, there's two different concepts here. I think actually both Tony and you are saying this in slightly different ways. It may not belong in the same way. Um, one may not survive, I don't know. I mean, can go through the amendment process. Um, so, we have back a lot of questions. I, <coughs> right, I, I would like to, so first of all, it's 7.30. Um, I want to give everyone permission to not feel weird, weird about leaving if they want to. Um, I also want to make sure everyone's questions are, are answered. So I'd like to go, just, I, I, I know, but I would like to go uh, for at least 10 more minutes, but after that, we're going to hang around and we can ask, we can do questions on that. Um, so, please. When I think, I may be, what's confusing about this to me, maybe for other people, I think it goes back to what somebody said at the very beginning of the meeting is what is a unit. So, we're talking about saying that um, seven units. Well, if we haven't defined what unit is, and a developer comes in and, and the market is attracting developers to make these 1,200 square foot units, but we haven't defined those other units by square feet. A developer might be able to get many more units in the same space as the one that allowed the seven by making them smaller. But since we're talking here, we're specific in under E affordable housing B, we're very specific about the size of the unit and saying that that's the small kind we want. And and I take it that you've written it this way to create an incentive for developers to want to do those units by saying, if you do this, you won't have to do affordable housing because it'll be an incentive to build these. But if if we if we define what unit is. And we make sure that every developer, whatever they do, has to do a certain percentage of the unit affordable. So, Carol, I think I think does that make sense? Yes, it does. I think okay. that is. I think I, we see what we're getting at, and, and unit is defined, I believe, and the definition is part of the, of the zoning code. Um, Someone asked at the beginning, and the answer Carolyn was Carolyn defined it. What? Carolyn defined it. Um, I thought it was actually. I'm sorry. Defined. There's a kitchen, and it has a bathroom, and then it. it, it, it sort of unclear beyond that. How well, um, I, I may be mistaken, but I think it's actually defined in the beginning of the zoning check. Um, I'd have right. to check. But I, if I get to kind of the essence of, of your question is, um, I don't I don't read this in a way that someone can build a smaller unit and therefore build many more than is allowed by the fundamental rules about density. You still need 2,500 square feet per unit and so forth. It's just that 2,500 square feet per unit. And so, if you're building a large development, the way this is written now is we want to make sure some of them are affordable. Right now, it's contemplated is also meaning you can make the units smaller, but there is disagreement about whether that actually will result in affordable housing, which is a legitimate. But I'm suggesting there's a way to write it so that even the a development of smaller units has to have one 
smaller than that. Okay, well then I would suggest we talk again okay. after this and we can talk about the exact language. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, it seems to me that a lot of the questions we have are answered by the existence of other parts of the, of the laws and the ordinances and the codes of North Hampton. But you're not putting everything in here because we have a sustainability document and we have something about traffic and streets. So it would help me if we could have something in writing that, that just guides us through the, the other parts of the law that this bumps up against, you know, it, it could be on the, so that we don't have to, I don't have to walk through all of the laws of North Hampton. So the, the parts of the, I, I would love a list, but I would, it just also seems to me that all of this is after the fact, or it's right in the middle, you know, it's, if I'm a builder, if I'm a developer, um, I present my plan, and before I get approval, everybody can weigh in, which is all lovely, but what we talked about with Lyman, and I think it's true of Shaw's Motel, is how do we get into the conversation with a developer right at the beginning, right? How does that happen? If, if, if the sale, once there is a sale of land, is that where we should all be on top of meeting with the builder? Should we be proactive and meeting with various people in town who might be interested? I mean, it just seems to me that yeah. we should be there at the design phase mm -hmm. as as neighbors. I my reaction is <clears throat> there probably are ways to do that, and that's been done before. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's separate, of course, from discussion of the ordinance okay. as you point. But I think it would be I think it's a good idea to talk probably after this about specific ways, especially for Fort Hill Line. I think, for example, last thing developers want to be caught up in lawsuits about compliance with special permits in cases they favor I think working on something ahead of time, perhaps. If I could just piggyback on so, that too, when we had I, a conversation about Lyman, this, this <clears throat> people at Smith were there during that public forum, and they heard that they that, and so we talked about doing a public, a pre sort of before they do an RFP, sort of get ideas about what should potentially go in the RFP. Now they don't have to. Accommodate that request. No, they but always said it was their fiduciary responsibility to get the largest amount of money possible right. for that piece of land. So I think I'm not counting on Smith for anything. They just want out. They but just want to divest. I, I, I want to I want to separate this conversation from from the ordinance, if I may. I know it's kind of harsh, but I do it out of love. Um, and I think that we're almost of the ordinance anyway. Um, and so. And, <laughs> Actually, the last part is just, um, it, it has to do with something that came out of the last forum. Um, we added barriers, block headlights, and driveways. That's what that is. That's it. Um, so now we've, we've finished the ordinance. Um, and I would like to say thank you, everyone, for coming. I think we should formally draw this to a close. Um, and we can have a few more questions, but I think people should feel free to, to drift out. Um, and. I think the process going forward is, first of all, the Ordinance Committee is meeting, like I said, on Monday, September 22nd, at 5 o'clock in the City Council Chambers. That's what they're currently scheduled to meet. They could very well vote on this. Well, they includes me um, on that day. Um, then it goes back to full council after that. That's right. And then you need six affirmative folks in council to pass that. So that gets you into October, November. Um, that's the process going forward. I certainly welcome more comments on an individual basis with some of the ad hoc groups that have formed uh, to talk about this. I think I speak for Council Sherry when I, when I say that and other councils in the room. Um, and so that's that's what I see going forward. If there are other forums and vision, that's fine. Um, but I hope we can keep the conversation going. Um, and again, thank you very much for the time. Brian, can I, I just want to add one more design thing that it's actually important that isn't touched upon here. And it has to do with infill on larger lots around the city. It's, it's a factor on Henry Street, it's a factor on Chestnut um, and Maple up in Florence that, that we have these, you know, any lot that's just under half an acre, that these, um, that they start to fall into the, the range of these larger projects and that I think for those types of situations, we need to take a closer look at what kind of infill can actually happen there. 
And currently the zoning says, well, you can have a house or you can have a long um, building extending into the lot. And in some cases, you know, it, it can be, you know, several hundred feet long of attached structures. And that I think that we need to come up with some sort of mechanism so that there's, that the development of property can be either a house or, or something in between some enormous structure, which might be a flag lot for some homes or something, I don't know. But, but I see that as something that's going to be pervasive as these things move forward. Mm -hmm. Do you think that kind of change belongs in this ordinance? Well, I just, I, I think it needs to be part of the discussion because it's, it's something we're opening up here with, with these, you know, four, seven or more or a little less. It's, the, you know, it's kind of in that range between three and eight or ten units and um, that um, we, need, we need to have some sort of plan because when a project actually plops down into a neighborhood, and you know, suddenly neighbors are looking out and there's five units going in, um, and, and it's being discussed at planning board or whatever, still you know, having some sort of idea of what we want to happen in those situations, I think would be really good. Yeah, and I think it again illustrates, I mean, if there's a larger conversation about zoning that uh, requires more fundamental reform than today's ordinance talks about, I think, that, I think that's fine. Uh, I just, I, I think we should make the distinction between the different vehicles. Um, but I, I agree that's a good topic for conversation. Um, Can I just Julie, ask a question? question. Um, if at any point when the city council votes to put these into law, does that end the moratorium? So in other words, if they vote before December, then that's it. There's no more work. There's no more waiting and and reworking. That's right. Substitutes the language in more time. As it's currently written. Mm -hmm. For those of us who like to see things concretely, taken these along with the more the uh, last year's uh, infill density. Uh, ordinance, put it together and said, this is what it can actually look like. Yes. If someone were, were saying, okay, I want to know how many units actually, for example, can end up on the line in the state. Can there really be a thousand units there? Could there really be 2,000 cars? I mean, has someone done that? Has the planning department done that? And if it hasn't, could someone do a schematic on some of the major properties that are available to say, yeah, this is, I'm not saying a developer's gonna wanna do this. That's one question. Could we see it or something like, like it? Like the worst case scenario. Yeah, so it's gonna I'd like to, I think that would be really helpful to see, so we have some real facts. And the second piece is really a legalistic one, but in this ordinance, I'm wondering why, and I exclude from this my friends like Bob Walker and developers of that ilk, if you take a very large multinational corporation with a peak cutter ability to come in and put in a massive number of units very quickly and say, you know what? They comply with everything here. Because they're very creative and they have a lot of orders. And they've done it. They say, comply with everything. I'm wondering why there isn't a safety valve here that says that even the this compliance here nonetheless is subject to at least the planning board saying that this project is both consistent with the neighborhood and does not overburden the neighborhood so that the project that just came into alignment and put in the 200, 500, 1,000, whatever it is, units, can't actually do that because, you know what, Lyman Road really can't take 1,000 cars. This is kind of what I was And thinking. I think there should be a safety valve here. Mm -hmm. and I don't see the safety valve. That's why the planning board, that's why this is a special permit and discretionary. Yes, but it's not, totally it's not totally discretionary. The yeah. planning board cannot make it up as it goes along. The planning board does not have a car plan to say, oh, we don't like it. Yes, it's got to meet reasonable requirements of the planning board. But at least, the, as I understand the zoning laws, if it meets the basic requirements of the city ordinance, the planning board does not have car plan to say, oh, we just don't like it too much, we're done. 
There are other, there's other language in the special permit criteria that apply to all special permits throughout the city that talk about um, consistency with neighborhood character and, and there's a whole litany of things in section 10 of the ordinance that's about special permits. Back to Dale's point, I think it would be really helpful for you to lay that out yeah, to the community. That, I think that would be good to have everyone review. Okay. I mean, I, I can, I don't know if everyone saw the documents I put online before this meeting, but I mean, I'm happy to follow up with further documents, and I, if I can find that, that, that could be one of them. Okay. I, I just wanted to add to um, underscore Bill's point. We, Ryan was kind enough to come with us, and I know Councilor Sciarra have, has wandered through the area because you, you go there a lot yourself. Um, but we've done a few walking tours to just show people in parts of Ward 3 this is what the zoning laws would allow to happen here so you can actually see it. There could be 12 units here, there could be 17 units here. And I think it might be really helpful before anything else happens to um, organize and maybe allow people who'd like to come on such a tour to look at the different neighborhoods that we're talking about, Lyman, Shaw's, wherever else um, in wards three and four, and, and have a look at what this really means. Because the language is, is all fine and good, but when you put this language into the existing infrastructure of these neighborhoods, which differ widely and which are already fairly dense, and many of which have roads that are only one way now, Williams, Pomeroy, these, you know, no matter how many traffic commerce you put in and how, uh, how many times you say, well, the, the speed limit will be 15 miles an hour, if you add 50 cars, it doesn't matter. You're still causing havoc. So anyway, I would invite people to um, join us if you'd like to go on a tour. We'll we'll make some announcements and please join us. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, this is kind of directed more towards the Fort Hill, but is there a method in the city to petition the city to actually change the zoning of the district? Is there a, a process to do that? Where the residents of a of a ward or of an area could petition the city because with Fort Hill, and if you look at the map, you know it's it's a very black and white parcel of land there. You know the, the upper Fort Hill area is so residential and attached to the URB section, whereas the lower part of that, which borders Constant, is definitely a URC applicable type of area. And I'm wondering, is there a method where the neighborhood could actually get together and petition? get a vote and ask the city to change well the zoning in yeah. that one parcel. The and does it have to be started by the owner or can it be done publicly? To answer your question, I mean it's a city form of government, so you would effectively do that through your representatives. What we tried that in the Ward Three uh, neighborhood on Henry Street. We tried with Owen to get it separated to make a different zoning thing and it failed. Nobody supported that idea as far as this right, Jim, that we were, this was Owen was We looked trying. at the differences between URC and URB and found that they were negligible in a lot of ways. Um, so, um, but it is something that we still are entertaining. But, you know, in the Fort Hill area, I mean, you know, the URB zone, you know, zoning is much more, you know, is much more logical for that area. You know, to keep the, the, the height down to 35 feet, which is typical of the residents in that area. You know, um, which in turn this way, would, if I can respond to keep that, keep the population of potential put it this way. development there, right? Um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I guess I'm not adamantly opposed to matching. I just think they need to be debated and be thoughtful and um, serve as the broadest group of people as possible. I mean, Oh, I think that's the residence of the I, 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 This will help you answer your question. Um, here's Lyman, here's the Lyman estate. And I think maybe one of the points you're making or, or, or suggesting is this yellow is so close to this that you might as well make this yellow too. Then again, excuse me? And that, that's and then again, so on the other hand, Lyman estate is yeah. red. Yeah. He's colored. This, this is yellow, and you might want to make the red yellow. What he's saying is you yeah. so yeah. close yeah. to the red yellow. For example. Um, you should have seen me, I failed kindergarten. Um, but the other hand, I mean, if you look at the area around town, it, it kind of makes sense to be the densest since that is what surrounds town. So that's all to say, I'm not opposed to that. I just think we have to debate it and have a thoughtful uh, discussion on it. So, Bob, was, I think you were asking what 
would the process be? Yeah, it's like it's like it's like it's like that process. It's a legislative yeah. change, just like well, this ordinance. Unless Ryan, it, I don't think there's any way. It makes sense on the map, but it doesn't make sense in practice. And, and I think so. So Joe says it makes sense on the map, but it doesn't make sense in practice. Yeah, yeah. Another way, I agree. So it doesn't make sense in practice. That's a beautiful chunk of it. Should have been talking to the Accommodation Committee decades ago about it, but to just say, oh, it looks like it should, it's dense, so let's build on it. That's a beautiful chunk, and to me, it's a crime if it gets developed, but that's life. Oh, wow. Well, well, it's going to have point that, the, the, the point that I, the point that I was making is that, in fact, um, I, I don't know, I think the, the point of view I raised is legitimate, it could be wrong. Point of view others have raised are also legitimate. They be wrong to it's something that you have competing philosophies. And it's the map, it's the fundamental basis of all the other zoning sits on top of the map. So it's very important. But I mean, like I said at the, at the onset of answering the question, I'm open to discussing a map change. I just think we have to be thoughtful about it. And again, I, it, it will be separate from this ordinance, yeah. which is just the nature. Um, well, I, I'm just going to go back to a point I, I made earlier and responding to some of the comments that have been made, especially the woman from Fruit Street who said, living in town is this way, you have too much traffic and it's noisy. I don't believe it has to be that way. And I think what Kathy was asking about is like, where are models where, where cities who are where we're at have faced this in a very creative way? And one of my own personal frustrations is that we come to meetings and a plan is in front of us and we're reacting to it. Well, I feel like we haven't had the, and we're not city planners, you're not a city planner, none of us, or maybe people know more than I do, but the, 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 some of the people on this Zoning Matters, which is a, is a local you know, citizens committee, wonder whether the city would bring in an outside person that would just from an outside perspective offer us what they see from what their city or from their experience, just without looking at what our plans are, and see if we can't uh, come up with something that's sort of more proactive, and then ex and also extend, you know, in an to extend this until January, because I think you get a sense from the meeting that people have a lot of questions and a lot of concerns, and I don't know how it would be resolved by September. I, I like to say, just first of all, before, you know, um, I, I, probably everything I say is not something that's music, music to your ears. You know? um, I'm just trying to be honest with you, number one. Um, that's why I talk about the different challenges, the philosophies about the map. I'm just, just being honest. People have different ideas. As far as a consultant, I mean, I don't know, that's a whole other, whole other thing. I mean, I'm open to talking about it. I also understand that. It would be nice to have something in place for Shaw's Motel and others, but I mean, I, I, I want to as much as possible deal with the specifics. You know, what, what are we talking about for a consultant? How much would the cost be and so forth? But I mean, it's not like I'm trying to throw cold water on, on anything else. You have ideas. I know. <laughs> we it. can get back to you. Ideas are dangerous things. Um, well, thank you. Any other, sir? I just had a quick question. I got here late. I don't know if this is already discussed, but um, <coughs> historical preservation. You know, there are a few really nice buildings there. I really think that um, any plan you have with it really should involve some kind of preservation of those buildings. And you know, the other thing we might, you might get lucky and someone might buy this and we just want to preserve the building and not build anything. That's a long shot, but who knows? Um, yeah. So open our wallets, how much do we have for real? Mm -hmm. We might have 20 bucks. No, we yeah. <laughs> more. Yeah. But okay, that's a, that's a valid point. And actually, Council Sheriff had, and I have talked about that with regards to those two buildings. On, I mean, I heard some, you know, certainly some developer could build around those buildings. Have blue boats into their plan and build something else as well. I think, um, I definitely, I, uh, I lived on the neighborhood that Smith College basically right down to build the building. Oh, okay. So I'm definitely into historical preservation. I don't think we do okay. a good enough job. Just my opinion. Okay, no, it's, a, it's a, thank you for reading. Okay. No one else has, no one else has raised that. But yeah, historic preservation, back to Anything else? I had talked yeah. about that at the other meeting. Said that we talked about the possibilities and gave ideas about preserving the oh, okay. mansion and, and, <laughs> and also, yeah. So that's yeah. Well, new. <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. No, well, it, it, it goes to this map thing because I was just thinking Carolyn's comment that the planning board 
in keeping with the, in keeping with the neighborhood. And the interesting thing about the Lyman property is 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 that line. If you go if you if you use the determinative neighborhood as lying in Columbus and Monroe, you have one thing. If you use the neighborhood as Fruit Street, you have a whole other thing. Right. You know? Well, even so, within those, you have many different Yeah, things. I mean, so, so it's there's not, so there's it not becomes, a single. Um, yeah. So it's a choice on the part of the planning board. You can't build down into that part of the no, no, so I know, but I, I mean, there, lean, there's I a topographic. The line inside. Yeah, there's a topographic and there's a feature right. there that sort of forces that. You know, that whole area used to be more than four until the bureaucrats in Boston changed it for that line of the state used to be more than four. And, and no matter which ward it is, it affects, and, and this is not taking anything away from ward three, but it affects the character of the ward four neighborhood most dramatically and and uh, in a larger quantity than it does Ward 3. And again, that's no disrespect at all to Ward 3. It's the, the, the map lines, my point in it is the map lines do not designate the reality of who's on the ground of what's in the situation as, as is. So, so. so thank you. You have the honor of, I think, doing the last comment. I think it's two hours. Let's call it too close, but I'm here to